Yours truly was on Fox News yesterday. Um, I want to go ahead and watch the clip again, and then I'll give you guys a breakdown of exactly what it was like every step of the way. I'll tell you what it was like when I was in there, in the belly of the beast, in the lion's den. Um, and I'll tell you guys my experiences on air and off air. And um, yeah, I'm just going to break it all down for you. So let's take a look at the clip. Well, for a discussion, let's bring in our fair and balanced radio panel. Joining us now from Philadelphia, Rich Zioli and self-described liberal host Kyle Kalinsky. Gentlemen, nice to see both of you. Uh, the president was tweeting that yesterday, this morning on Easter morning before church also went on Twitter. He said this, Mexico is doing very little, if not nothing. It's stopping people from flowing into Mexico along their southern border and then into the U.S. They laugh at our dumb immigration laws. They must stop the big drug and people flows or I will stop their cash flow. NAFTA need wall exclamation point. Uh, Rich, what do you think is going on here? Uh, the president didn't get funding for his wall. His base is upset. And now we see this sort of hardening of his line on immigration. Leland, happy Easter. I think the president has this unique ability. Donald Trump makes the blue states act more blue. And what I mean by that is you take Brown's actions, right? Pardoning people, including a kidnapper, so that they don't have to face deportation. And, you know, Trump knows he's never going to win California, but he doesn't have to as long as he can win Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan. And ask yourself this question, you know, are blue collar workers in those states, are they going to side with Trump on this issue or Jerry Brown, who says, you know what, we're going to pardon you so, so that so, so you, you don't so have you, to be So you view, the, you view this sort of as a purely political calculation by the president uh, to try yes. and, and push things. OK, and I'm and I'm I'm just going out on the limb here, Kyle, you probably uh, agree with that. So uh, when it comes to these pardons and commutations, I think we're having a little bit of a false debate here because there were 56 pardons and 14 commutations, and 95% of them were for nonviolent drug offenders. So uh, uh, Kyle, if you want to say- Hold on, Kyle. I, 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 I'm not talking about the pardons and commutations. I'm talking about President Trump here. Is, do, you think, do you think this is a political calculation on his part that uh, is uh, your uh, fellow uh, friend here, Rich, said that, you're, that they're able to, the president has viewed this as a way to sort of drive a wedge in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Does that work? If so, how do Democrats try and counter it? Uh, perhaps it's a political calculation, but in all seriousness, uh, parts of what he said in that tweet, I hope, are not political calculations. I wish he would pull out of NAFTA. NAFTA has absolutely destroyed uh, middle class families all across this country. And President Trump talks a good game on trade deals. He often says that he's going to stop doing the dumb trade deals that hurt uh, working families all across this country. But I've seen very little action on that front. In fact, uh, there's been 83,000 jobs that have been outsourced as uh, under President Trump's first year. Mm -hmm. So I wish that a lot of this wasn't talk, but unfortunately it is. Okay, well, uh, this seems to have uh, meandered into some very uh, different places than I thought it would, but we'll go ahead and take a listen to the president uh, today as he headed to church. Take a listen. The Democrats blew it. They had a great, great chance, but we'll have to take a look. But Mexico has got to help us at the border. They flow right through Mexico. They send them into the United States. Can't happen that way anymore. All right, Kyle, same analysis here. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't understand why he frames this issue as a criminal issue when well, Rich, according to Rich, a, a, Rich just told you why he did, which is that he thinks it works well for him in Ohio and Pennsylvania they and, are, they and, are and other states. So the question is, how would Democrats try to counter that? Well, I mean, simply they could point out the fact that uh, 99.75% of dreamers uh, are law-abiding citizens and about 91% uh, of dreamers work or go to school. So Democrats when you use- Democrats don't want a deal to help the dreamers. They don't want a DACA deal. Can we just stop pretending like the Democratic Party wants to solve this problem before midterms? You guys have nothing else to run on but fear, fear of deportation. So you want to keep that, that issue alive, keep that dream alive, if you will, now. And you'd love to keep it alive in 2020 as well, because the Democratic Party right now has nothing. Because as Jerry Brown proves, and as Phil Murphy in New Jersey proves, where he's announcing one and a half billion for illegal immigrants to fight Trump, uh, it proves that they go to the 
the left, the kooky left of their base. And it's not, it does not play well with mainstream voters. The reaction always to every Trump true. tweet, every Trump uh, position oh, okay, hold on. is to go left. They go further Rich, left. It's Rich, what you okay, guys okay. do. Rich, no, no, no. Rich, I we'll wish they would go further left. The majority of the American mm. people are in favor of the dreamers. And like I just said, over 99% of them are law-abiding citizens, and 99% of them work or go to school. Kyle. So this isn't a middle class, uh, uh, this isn't Rich, an issue that, with Kyle. that... Kyle, I want to ask you, you, said, you just said you wish who would go further left. I wish the Democrats would go further left. I wish the president would go further left. Again, like uh, well, I was just okay, talking well, about, okay, President well, Trump referenced NAFTA in okay. that tweet, Fellas, we and go. I wish he would pull out of NAFTA. I wish he would go to the left. Huh. He, on the campaign okay. trail, he went to the left on, on war issues. He said he would get us out of Iraq. He said he would get huh. us out of Afghanistan. He didn't do well, those well, things. Well, I wish he on. would do oh, those hold things. On. Yeah, well, and, and also now he's saying that major change possibly in U.S. policy is going to uh, pull troops out of Syria a lot earlier uh, than we thought. Rich, Kyle, appreciate it, guys. we got to run. Thanks. Thank Happy you. Easter. Appreciate Thanks, guys. It. All right, Liz. I've now watched that interview about three or four times, and I want to go ahead and tell you guys what my thought process was. Now, before I get to that, I'll tell you what the whole situation was like in general. Now, um, it is very streamlined and industrialized. I mean, you show up, there's like literally three or four different layers of security at the building. You have to show your ID, you have to show a special card that they give you anytime you go from one room to another. Um, the most interaction I had when I was there was with the makeup girl. And she was very sweet, very nice. They they basically <laughs> they basically put like like peach paint on your face. It didn't even feel like they were doing makeup on my face. They took like peach colored paint and they slopped it on and then they you know like colored drew, drew in the lines basically in my face and um they were talking about how oh we got to give you a darker um you know foundation than what your skin color actually is because those lights are so bright that if if we give you the the same color foundation as your skin you know it you're gonna you'll come across as so white that it won't it won't look good so they give you a darker foundation so that under the bright lights it evens it out and it makes it look normal. And then when I saw on the I saw the result, I was like, oh, that's that's true. It actually does make me look relatively more normal <laughs> um, since they put the darker foundation on. Um, so I, she was very helpful, um, the makeup lady. And so uh, this show is shot out of D.C. I was in New York, and. So I was at their studio in New York. I, by the way, I, I didn't see any stars or at least any stars that I knew. I think there was one guy who I saw going into the makeup room next to me who's a host, but I don't know who the fuck he is. Um, and when it came time to shoot um, the, the segment, it's like I was brought to a floor that was basically empty. Okay. There are a bunch of desks around and stuff. But it was basically empty. There was one dude there. One dude who was sitting like in front of a computer. And I was put in like the corner of a room that was kind of cordoned off a little bit. And then I, I sent a picture on Twitter of what my view was like. It was, you know, you saw a few different monitors in front of me and stuff. And the thing behind me, I know it looks like there's a whole like giant thing happening behind me. That was just a regular TV screen. It was about a 55-inch, maybe 60-inch TV screen. And um, I think it was showing a live feed of the main floor in New York City. So that, that thing that was happening behind me was actually happening in the same building I was in, but it was from a different floor. Um, and then recorded the segment, and then was done, and that was that. And so, all right, now let's get to the segment itself. It, it's it's weird, you know. I, I have obviously plenty of experience with new media and now experience with corporate media. And all I can say is that corporate media, the debate feels contrived. It feels streamlined. It feels just like industrial. It feels detached and disconnected. I mean, they, they just usher, usher me into the room, sit me down in the seat. And then the first time I ever had a word with the host was literally when he was like, okay, how, how do you pronounce your name? I was like, Kyle Kalinske. He's like, okay, and how you would describe yourself as a secular radio host? I said, no, I describe myself as, you know, you could say left-wing host. He said liberal host, so he changed it a little bit there. But um, 
that was the only, um, you know, conversation I had with the guy when he was already on air, just asking me during the commercial break, hey, how do you say your name? And then boom, we start and we jump right into it. And you could tell the way that they do it is, it's a four minute segment is what it was supposed to be. It went a little over. I, I got to speak for maybe a minute and a half, maybe two minutes max. Um, but you could see what they're trying to do there. They're trying to say, okay, this person's got to play the Republican, you have to play the Democrat, and then you do your partisan talking points back and forth. And, you know, they they short-circuited when I didn't, like, respond exactly in those partisan ways. And you could tell that they really didn't know how to deal with it. Like, the host, Leland, was like, well, you're, we're meandering here into places I didn't think we would go. And, you know, I, I wanted to say, that's what happens when you have thoughtful people on who actually give a shit about the issues. <laughs> and you don't have fucking bobbleheads who are just spewing talking points. Um, so... You could tell what they were looking for, and you could tell that I wasn't really delivering exactly what they were looking for. Uh, but it was interesting to see their reaction to that. Now, the first, uh, the, the question was so bizarre. Now, pe people were saying, some people were saying on Twitter, like, oh, you, you know, you didn't really, like, answer the question. And then I, I was thinking about it, and guys, the question he was asking me wasn't even fucking registering in my brain. Because it's just a weird question. He asked, uh, is what Trump's doing a political calculation? How the fuck do I know? What does that even mean? Is it a political calculation? What do I have, uh, the ability to read Donald Trump's fucking thoughts? I don't know what the hell's going on in that guy's mind. And that's why, basically, I didn't really answer that question, and I just started talking about the issue itself. I, saw, I was like, and by the way, you guys know me. I, every interview, every conversation I ever go into, I have the same fucking thought process. My thought process is as simple as can be. Tell the truth. That's it. That's all I think about. That's all I care about. There's no fucking plan. It's just be honest. Tell the truth. That's, all, that's the only rule. If that's your only rule in every conversation you ever had, you're going to be all right. And so I went into it going, just tell the truth. That's it. Doesn't matter what the issue is. Just tell the truth. But when he asked me a question, and it looks like I don't give a direct answer, the only reason I wasn't giving a direct answer is because their question wasn't registering in my mind. Because, notice, and here's the thing, and you'll see this a lot on corporate media, they rarely talk about the issue itself. They talk about the people talking about the issue. See the difference? So talking about the issue itself is, what do you think of NAFTA? What do you think of the border wall? That's okay. Let's talk. Let's talk about the issue. Let's talk about immigration. Let's talk about those pardons and commutations that they were talking about. The governor Jerry Brown in California did. Let's talk about NAFTA. Um, but they don't do that. They avoid the talk on the actual substantive issues. They want to talk about the people talking about the issues. So Donald Trump can mention something about NAFTA or the border wall. A Democrat can respond to that. But you're not supposed to talk about the actual issues. You're supposed to talk about what they said about those issues. Which is just such a low level, uh, you know, it's a weird level of discourse because it's just, at no point do you touch on anything that matters. Because I don't give a fuck about what's going on inside Donald Trump's mind. I'm not a fucking mind reader. I don't know if it, what he did or said was a political calculation or not a political ca calculation. All I can tell you is my thoughts on those substantive issues that he touched on. So that's why it's like, oh, you didn't really answer the question. That's all I know how to do is answer the question in a policy substance way, and you're asking me a question that I don't have a fucking answer. How the fuck am I supposed to know? W was it a political calculation? What does that even mean? Why are we having this? Con what a stupid conversation to have. So, um, it was a weird question. So that's why I couldn't really answer it directly. Now, I started by addressing the premise of the conversation. So, in other words, this is how they set it up. They said, okay, Governor Jerry Brown did pardons and commutations. They talk about how, oh my God, they were a violent, uh, formerly violent criminals. How dare he? And so then they take the, the, that set of facts. They say, Donald Trump responded and ripped him and, and ripped Jerry Brown, ripped immigration and all that stuff. And then, hey, hey, what do you... Shit, Siri just went on. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um... So they rip him, and then they go, hey, what do you think of Trump's motives in ripping him? 
So in other words, obviously Trump is right about the substance of the immigration thing and, and all that. But what do you think about him ripping Jerry Brown? Do you think it's a political calculation or is it not a political calculation? So in many ways, that's actually genius. Because what you're doing is you're baking into the premise of the question. Well, obviously Trump is right. Obviously he's right about what he's saying. But the, the debate is not whether or not he's right on the policy issues. They change the debate to... Hey, what are his motives in being so right in slamming uh, Jerry Brown? And that's why I, I basically kind of rejected the framework of the question. And I went back to, well, no, hold on, hold on here. Let's talk about these pardons and commutations that you're all assuming are so evil and wrong and terrible. I looked at the pardons and commutations. Uh, there were 70 in total. You know how many were of formerly violent um, criminals? Three. That means 95% of the pardons and commutations were of nonviolent drug offenders. And not only should they be pardoned, the, the state should fucking apologize to them and they should pay them restitution for ruining their lives over a nonviolent drug offense, which shouldn't even be a fucking crime in the first place. So that's what I was trying to point that out. Like, no, 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 no. 95% of these pardons and commutations are of people who shouldn't have even been locked up in the first place. And then they did, I didn't have a chance to get to it, but my next point was going to be, and of the people who were formerly violent... Uh, criminals, they've been released from prison. One of them was out since 1997. Another one was out since the year 2000. And they've become model citizens. They're fucking working now and they got families and they're totally rehabilitated. And the only reason Jerry Brown pardoned them is because they were about to be deported. So they were formerly criminals, totally reformed, totally rehabilitated. That's a proven fact. It's been the case for decades. They picked out these people because they were such upstanding citizens now. And they were going to be deported, so they said, pardon, so now you're not going to get deported. So this is a way for, for Jerry Brown to say, fuck you to Trump with his hardline immigration stuff. But this is a rare instance where Jerry Brown is actually right about something. And usually Jerry Brown's kind of a corporate -y Democrat, and I disagree with him on a million things. But this is an area where he's right. And I was going to get to that point, too. That you're framing it like these guys are a fucking, you know, menace to society right now. They're not. They're just not. That's not true. So, in other words, my whole point was attacking the premise because they baked the premise in and then they said, well, oh, why do you think Trump is so right? Is it a political calculation or is it not a political calculation? What the fuck is that? So I attacked the premise of the question. That kind of, um, you know, sent them off. And then, so the next thing I tried to do, guys, and by the way, I'm just letting you know, this was all on a subconscious level because I only have one rule when I go into the, all these conversations, which is tell the truth. But there was something cooking up in the subconscious mind there that was making me go in these, uh, in these directions. So the next thing was, he reiterated the question to me basically because I didn't answer the question. I tacked the premise of the question. Um, and then what did I say? I said, I wish some of what Trump was saying is not a political calculation. Because some of that I agree with. He keeps huffing and puffing about NAFTA. Bitch, pull out a NAFTA. I want you to do that. I'm in favor of that. Now, here's why. <laughs> That's, that was such a good move. <laughs> I know I'm talking about myself here, so that's not, I shouldn't be saying it like that, but I mean it because that worked even better than I thought it would work because after the uh, interview, I heard from people who I know who are diehard Trump supporters who were like, you did great. You did great. And I like what you had to say. Now, hold on. You're, uh, these people are diehard Trump supporters. They're Republicans. And they came out of the conversation going, you did, you did great. You did better. I agreed with you more than the other guys. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. So now we walk away from that conversation going, people on the left go, well, of course that guy was right. And now Republicans and Trump supporters are like, no, I agree with that guy. Now, why? It's all in the framing. I'm not going out there saying, Donald Trump is wrong. I'm going to tell you why he's wrong. Because then they'd shut down. They shut down, they go, fuck this guy. Yeah, okay, li fucking triggered libtard who hates Trump. What I did is, I said, Trump is so right, I wish he would do it. Call their bluff, that's what that is. I'm calling your bluff, Donald Trump. Oh, is it a political calculation? I don't know, maybe it is. But I wish it wasn't for some of the shit you said. I wish you would pull out of NAFTA. T Donald Trump ran, he did good, he talked on these trade deals, a great game. And that's when you slip in the fact. And by the way, I fucked up the fact. I said there were 83,000 jobs outsourced under Trump's first year. Wrong. There were 93,000 jobs outsourced under Trump's first year. So, 
any, either way, if somebody wanted to fact check that, they could look it up and go, oh, he was wrong. It's actually worse than what he said. So you frame it as, no, 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 Trump's not wrong. I wish he would do the things he's huffing and puffing about. I wish he would do that. And that disarms the minds of Republicans and pro-Trump people. And they go, yeah, you know what? He did say on the campaign trail, get a NAFTA. Why is he saying now? Like, I'm going to pull out of NAFTA. Just fucking do it. You said you're going to do it. Do it. Do it. We want you to do it. We want you to bring back jobs, uh, factory jobs for the middle of the country. And then again, in the midst of saying, no, 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 he's not wrong. He's actually totally right. That's when you slip in the fact about how he's all talk. And that's how, you know, listen, man, that's th the trick is, how do you get a dog to take a pill? This is not to compare Republicans to dogs, by the way. This is an analogy. Uh, you put the pill in applesauce and you give them the applesauce and they think they just had applesauce. No, bitch, you just had a pill. It's the same thing with politics. Tr Trump is definitely right. Of course he's right. I wish he wasn't fucking doing a political calculation. I wish this wasn't talk. He needs to do that. And that's how you get people. Obviously, your side's going to agree with you if they care about the issues because they'll go, yeah, you should get out of NAFTA. But then you just made it so that many Republicans agree with you and pro-Trump people go, yeah, you know what? He did talk about that. Okay, and that's that was when I got the response from the host. Well, this is meandering into places I didn't expect it to go. Because, listen, how do they respond to that? How do you respond to that? So you're a Fox News host or you're the conservative guest. You're pro-Trump. You're a big-time Republican. How do you respond to that? You could say... No, Kyle, he shouldn't pull out of NAFTA. In which case, what are you doing? You're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with Trump. So Mr. Pro-Trump person would have to say, I'm, I, I disagree with Trump. Now, again, that further feeds into my narrative of anybody watching is going to go, actually, Kyle's right. Because the left-wingers will say he's right on the issue of NAFTA. The right-wingers will say he's right because he's backing President, Trump, President Trump's arguments. So that puts them in a corner. That's why they didn't know how to respond. Because when you blow up their partisan mindset, ah, uh, you're meandering and let's try to get you back on fucking topic and cut you off 32 times. So, okay. Then, now I didn't have time to respond to this point. I wish I did in retrospect, but there was one, <laughs> there was one point where it was hilarious because the guy, the, the guy who I was talking to, who I have nothing against at all, but he tried to he'd go back into the Fox News tap dance, which is, you guys have nothing else to run on, talking about the Democrats. But he, he said, you guys, and like including me with the Democrats. <laughs> well, anybody who knows, who knows this show and knows me, I'm not, I don't play the fucking tribalism, partisan bullshit. All I care about are the fucking issues. So when he tries to lump me in there, it's like, you do, you're, it's such rank tribalism and silliness that you're not thinking about this in an issues-based way. You're thinking about it in terms of party line. Then, um, the final point is, and this is when I, this is when everybody said, okay, you poured on the heat towards the end there when you got revved up, is because it, they made a, a fatal error <laughs> where they said, or one of them framed it as, well, this is what happens, is the, the left always goes far left, and, the, and that doesn't play in mainstream America. Now, again, in retrospect, my re reaction to that should have been the following words. You consider Bernie Sanders far left, and he's the most popular politician in America, according to every poll. That's what I should have said. Now, obviously, you can't get everything perfect, but my reaction to that was still, you know, it was, a, it was the second best response. The first best response would have been the Bernie Sanders comment, but I made the second best response, which was like, no, 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 I wish the Democrats would go far left. And then Leland pushed me on that and said, wait, who do you wish would go further left? I said, I wish the Democrats would go for left, further left, and I wish Trump would go further left. I wish he would pull out of NAFTA. Donald Trump ran against war in many respects. He said well, he's going to get us out of Iraq, he's going to get us out of Afghanistan, and he hasn't done those things. I wish he would do those things. And that's... Alright, we gotta go. Because <laughs> you blow up their minds, man, that's what you do. So listen, there's there are a few lessons in here for people. Um... I mean, one of them is just about the nature of corporate media, where they're not trying to talk about the issues, they're trying to talk about the people talking about the issues. So that diverts from any policy substance. So it was hard for me to answer directly when I don't know the fucking answer to that question. Was it a political calculation? How the fuck do I know? Is, it, is that what I'm supposed to say on Fox News in front of millions of people? Hey, yeah, what the fuck? What the fuck do I know? I don't know if this is a political calculation. No, I went directly to the issues uh, itself. But... I think the more important lesson is the following. 
obviously always tell the truth, but the second thing is try to find a way to frame things that are going to persuade people. If you really believe in what you're talking about, and I do believe in what I'm talking about, well, then you have to find a way to persuade people. You could try to shame people all you want. That ain't going to work. Look at Hillary Clinton. Her whole fucking campaign was based on shaming people. Let me give you a platitude. Let me give you a cliche. Um, and then let me try to shame you if you're not going to vote for me and you're on the left. That doesn't work because people tell you to fuck off when you do that. Because you're not really addressing their concerns. So you have to actually address people's concerns and you have to be persuasive. And in the process of doing that, you don't go into the lion's den and say, I'm going to fucking take on the lion. You go into the lion's den and you go, this lion is so right, let me explain to you how right the lion is, and in the process of explaining how right the lion is, uh, I'm going to tell you that all these left-wing ideas are the right ideas. That's how you do it. It's all in the framing. It's all in the framing. Now, there were some, some little points where I had to buck the orthodoxy on Fox News and take on Trump, but that's a given because the guy's wrong on so many things. You have to you know, buck a little bit, but you have to do it in a way where you're, you come so correctly with the facts that nobody could disagree with you. And if you'll notice, their reaction was unhinged when I brought up those facts. When I said, because Trump was saying, no more DACA deal. So, uh, well, what do you point out? 99.75% of the Dreamers are law-abiding citizens. 91% of them are employed or they go to school. These are good people. That's it. So I don't have to make a value judgment on that front. The facts are going to point to the value judgment. But you don't make the value judgment. You just give the facts and then try to let them draw their own conclusions. Because if anybody hear those words coming out of my mouth, they're going to go, yeah, I guess they are not that bad people. And again, I pointed to the polls. Basically telling the audience, no, 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 you already agree with me, even if you don't know you agree with me. You already agree with me. What is it? 80%, 70% or something like that of the American people who support the Dreamers? People brought here as kids who have known nothing but America? No, you agree with me. You don't even know you agree with me, you agree with me. So yes, you're going to have to buck orthodoxy, but even when you're bucking orthodoxy every now and then, you have to do it in a way that's palatable. If I just come out there and I'm like, wrong, you're all bigots. Is that going to work? Is that going to fucking convince anybody? No. Now, to some people in the Fox audience, it might be true when I'm saying hey, you guys are bigoted. There are plenty of people listening to Fox who are bigoted. But you're never going to win anybody over when you do it like that. You got to go out there and you got to, you got to, again, put the pill in the applesauce. I'm not saying that Trump is dead wrong on dreamers. I'm just saying 99.75% of them are law-abiding citizens. 91% of them are employed or going to school. And they're good people who've been brought here as kids. I, I'm not saying anything but those things right there. That's it. And then let them draw their own conclusions. So, um... At first, when I got off air, I was talking to Lilith about it. She, she said, oh, you did a great job. And I was, I was like, I just felt sloppy. It just felt sloppy to me because the conversation was all over the place and I'm trying to get my points in and I'm getting cut off and all this stuff. But ultimately, when I watched it back a few times, uh, I, think, I think it went well. I think it went well. Um, it felt sloppy at first, but then when you watch it over and over and then you begin to break it down logically, you go, oh, yeah, no, with the, with the hand of cards I was dealt, I did the best I could do, you know? I was dealt a 7-2 offsuit in Texas Hold'em, and I won the pot. It may not have been a big pot. It may have been just the blinds and maybe one other bet, but I won the pot. So um, as people were saying to me on Twitter... There concludes my career in corporate media. Because, <laughs> listen, they're probably not going to have me back. And honestly, I don't even know where I want to go back. I mean, maybe I would, but it's just a lot of fucking... It's a lot of... It's a pain in the ass for not that much payoff. And again, to compare it to new media, compare this to being on Joe Rogan or being on TYT. I mean, when I was on, on TYT for two hours. I get to say whatever the fuck I want on stories that I half picked myself, you know, um, and you get a, a, a giant platform when you do that. When I was on Rogan, I got the biggest platform I've ever had. It's over a million views on, on YouTube alone, probably, probably millions on iTunes, never mind the other platforms. And it was three hours of me and Joe just talking about everything under the sun. So I get to really, if I say something to Joe Rogan, and he doesn't agree with me, guess what? 
we got 30 minutes to have the conversation. <laughs> we got 30 minutes where he goes, no, here's why I disagree with you. Here's my argument. And I go, okay, that's interesting. I agree with certain parts of your argument, but here's the part where I disagree with. And we go back and forth. And we had that little back and forth, for example, on the issue of how old one should be to be allowed to vote and be allowed to do everything. I say, we should have a clean line at 16. He's like, no, man, it should be like fucking 25 to do everything. So we had disagreements and we went back and forth, but that's okay. That's the point is that he's never going to go, okay, we're going to cut you off and go to commercial break. We're done here. Did you say you're against the Iraq war? We got to go. <laughs> like, so you get to really, really, really get into the nooks and crannies of the ideas and there, you don't have to, to try to shove your point in or, or, you know, um, work with the, this limited structure that you're given when you're in new media, when you're in new media, you have all the freedom in the world. And I think it's just a superior platform. So, I don't think they want me back in the first place. They might. I don't know. I got an email from the producer who brought me on in the first place. He said, hey, great job. We'll have you back. Um, but I don't know if her higher-ups might be like... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but either way, I don't even know if I'd want to go back. I mean, maybe there's a conceivable circumstance in which I would. But my heart is obviously in new media where I'm doing what I'm doing with you guys right now. Where... How the where the fuck else am I going to be able to have this super long breakdown with my own platform, my own rules, I'm my own boss? You guys support me on Patreon two dollars at a time, like that's the model. Grassroots support, totally free and open platform, and we just need to make sure YouTube has to stop fucking us, because <laughs> of course they are fucking us, as everybody has uh, figured out in detail. Go watch the Humanist Reports video on that, by the way. Amazing video. He really gets into the specifics of it. Um, it's incredible stuff, but. This is where, um, this is where I belong, and I think everybody knows that.